uh, thanks very much. I um, am amazed and relieved uh, to see so many of you are here because the, when, I, um, when the heavens opened yesterday, I thought, well, surely Cape Townians aren't going to come. <laughs> Uh, they, they're not normally like that, um, but must be the University of Cape Townians are, are, are a cut above the rest. Um, the, I, it gives me great pleasure uh, to talk uh, to our alumni association. I'm going to be, I, I don't know of course what uh, d different disciplines you, are, you, are, um, you represent, um, but I'm going to touch on many disciplines. Um, you touch on, not, not drill down into. I'll, I'll talk about um, even a discipline we don't have at UCT. I'll talk about agriculture and, 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 and viticulture and oenology. I'll touch on them. Um, a lot more, though, I will, uh, I will talk about, um, about archaeology, about history, um, about musicology, um, uh, and business science. Um, but most of all, I'll talk about psychology. Um, because that's the topic that I know best. Um, and you'll see where it fits into what I'm going to be telling you, which you may be relieved to know after I've mentioned all those disciplines. Uh, you'll, you may be relieved to know that I'm really just going to tell you a story. Um, it's certainly not an academic um, uh, presentation at all. Uh, the formal title of what I'm going to be uh, saying is Psychological Impediments to Land Reform. Um, and I made that title up when Leber <laughs> asked me to talk to you. Um, uh, I, I was trying to give it some sort of academic ring. Um, but what it's, what it's, where, where it comes from is the story that I'm going to tell you, which is the story of what, of what I've experienced on my return to South Africa and on taking over this farm, um, posed enormous challenges of all kinds. And uh, of, uh, uh, in relation to this very, um, as, as you were just reminded, this very controversial and difficult topic of land reform. And um, in grappling with this, uh, these challenges, what I had recourse to, all that I had recourse to ultimately was psychological knowledge. Um, I, I don't for one moment want to claim that this is the correct discipline from which to um, launch and, 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 and attempt to solve uh, the problem of land reform. Uh, but I think it is uh, precisely because it's not where you would expect to start, that it's, a, that it's an unusual perspective, that I think perhaps it has something, um, it, something different, some uh, um, extra light to cast on the topic. Um, so that's sort of context, background. Uh, for those of you who speak Afrikaans, I better quickly warn you that the farm workers here, their nickname for me is Lang Asam. <laughs> yes, it means long-winded. So that was just the context. I haven't begun my talk yet. Um, I was asked to talk for about 45 minutes. It's best that we say I'm starting now. Um, Okay, so I am a, a, a South African. Uh, I was uh, born, in fact, I'm the sixth in seven generations South African family, um, by which I mean my children are the seventh generation. We've been here for a long time. Uh, my, my family were landowners in Germany. Uh, before they came here, they landed in Cape Town, and they took farms between here and Swellendam, uh, in the, mainly in the Uferberg. Uh, district. And um, it was a cousin of mine, Friedrich Solms, who has a farm, a beautiful farm in uh, the late Friedrich, that was the, the current Friedrich's father. Uh, they both called Friedrich slightly um, uh, confusing, but uh, the, the, the old man, uh, it was him who made it possible um, for me to, uh, and identified the, the, the opportunity for me here when I said I wanted to come back to South Africa. And when, um, I, I mean, I took one second to decide, yep, this is at Delta, I think I'll live here, thanks. It's an absolutely wonderful uh, place. As you've seen, despite the weather, uh, it's an extraordinarily beautiful farm. Um, but of course, these farms, uh, this one was established formally as a farm in 1690. Of course, these farms come with a hell of a historical uh, ba baggage. And I was very much aware of that. Um, I had left South Africa um, to escape the, the old conscription that we used to have. Uh, and while I was there, 
um, despite my field being, uh, being uh, what it is, um, which is, which is, as you heard, neuropsychology, uh, I took the opportunity while I was living in England, where I lived for 14 years, to train in uh, another field called psychoanalysis. It's really not um, what neuropsychologists do. It's, uh, it's sort of like really not wise to train in psychoanalysis if you want to be taken seriously as a neuroscientist. But uh, you'll, you'll see as my story unfolds, it was just as well that I did that while, while I was in England. But, you know, apartheid ended to my, no doubt, as much as everybody else's great surprise. And the premise upon which I had left the country uh, no longer uh, um, applying, um, I, I, I wrapped up my affairs as, as, as soon as I could um, and returned here. Um, with the idea that on taking on this farm, I will uh, have an opportunity to uh, address in a small way um, the, this legacy that I was, that I was alluding to um, a, a minute ago. You know, symbolically taking on one of these old Cape farms is taking on one of the places where the trouble all began. And it's also taking on the sins of my own particular fathers. Um, and so I thought um, that's an appropriate sort of citizen-sized uh, task to take on. Uh, I'm, I was delighted to come back to South Africa. I'd never left for, for, uh, uh, because I didn't want to live here, you know, so I was terribly homesick and I was just thrilled to be able to come back and to embrace South Africanness and to engage with, the, uh, with the, what was then really quite heady task of, you know, contributing to the reconstruction and development of the country. And uh, I, I thought um, this would be my little my little symbolic personal way of doing it, I'll just fix this one farm um, uh, and um, try to turn it into um, a, a, a microcosm of, the, of, of what we've... And, you know, uh, incidentally, if I may just say as an aside, I think that many people like me who are not politicians, you know, we're, we're um, uh, overwhelmed by the, by the challenges that we face in the country and we think, oh, what on earth could I do, you know, to these... The, 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 the problems are, over, are, are just impossibly large. Um, and so I, I recommend the approach that I took, if I may be so bold, you know, just to tackle some little thing uh, in your own immediate vicinity. And so I thought, well, that's what I'm going to do. So um, I, uh, remember, I'm just telling you a story. But remember, it's got an academic theme. Okay, I'll, I'll, it's called Psychological Impediments to Land Reform. Um, and you, <laughs> hopefully you'll see as I tell the story, why the why the, the, the theme is um, uh, uh, actually why it's justified for me to have given it that title. Um, so, I came back with my family. My children were born in England, um, and um, the uh, you know it's, as I said, it's an exquisitely beautiful place. And we landed here, and the very first thing that I wanted to do was to meet with the farm workers. In fact, I did so before. Um, before I brought my family, uh, I came on a little sort of reconnaissance trip, one of a few. I came for a weekend and uh, the idea was that I would spend the Saturday meeting with the people who live here. Because, and I want to pause for a moment in order to emphasize this point. Because in South Africa, if you inherit or acquire land, it's perhaps especially in this part of South Africa, I'm not sure how much it applies to agricultural land elsewhere in the country, I suspect it does quite generally apply, that if you inherit or, or, or purchase land, uh, it comes with people. I'm pausing for emphasis, you know, I mean, geez, it does, you know, it's a hell of a thing. You take on a piece of land and with that land comes people. And I put it in that crude sort of way in order to, you know, in, for, in order for the full sort of shock of it to, to be apparent. Because it's almost literally as if, you know, they belong to you. They're yours. They're, they're your responsibility. And um, so when I say that I was taking on the symbolic um, sort of um, uh, this, the legacy of our past, it's not entirely or, or only symbolic. I mean, it is symbolic, but alongside that symbolism, there's this kind of shocking brute reality that you practically uh, are a feudal lord if you own farmland in South Africa in the 21st century. There are people who come with the land who aren't there by choice. You know, it's not as if they have anywhere else to live. They, they don't have a, a, you know, a two, two pennies to rub together. 
Uh, they live under a roof provided by the farmer, uh, the landowner, and they are therefore beholden to him. Um, you know, it's they're in an extremely vulnerable position. And one way or another, for better or for worse, you, the landowner, are responsible for those people. So, um, you know, the, the, the reality of what I was doing in this idea, I'm going to come and transform one little, you know, a, a, a pile of hectares of, of South Africa. Um, the, even that, on, the, on that uh, fateful first sort of proper day of engaging with it, uh, even that is no small task. I realized upon that um, arriving here that morning and having these eight interviews, in fact it was seven interviews, um, lined up with a lunch break, <laughs> um, one hour each. Because there were, on, uh, this farm by the way has expanded, we're now three farms. At that stage there were seven families living on, on, on what, was, what was then uh, Delta Farm. Um, and the, there are many more families involved now than there were then. So the, the, the idea was I would meet with, meet with each one of those families in my dining room, my, my dining room to be, um, and uh, I started each interview with roughly the same sort of phrases, which were something like, you know, I'm very glad to meet you, um, um, my name's Mark, even though I look like my uh, 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 predecessors, uh, please know immediately I'm not the same. I'm, I'm nice, you know, I'm good. I, I didn't quite use the words like that, but I mean, this is what I was, I, I really did say, look, I want you to know immediately, you know, that this is not going to be the same as it was. I want to change this place. That's the whole idea. I've come back to South Africa in order to make uh, some small contribution to, I mean, to live there because I want to, but also in, in doing so to make some contribution to the, you know, to the transformation of, and, 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 and re redevelopment of the country uh, and, and of, the, you know, of the new democracy and whatnot. So, you know, this farm, uh, it's, uh, you know, um, I know what, you know, I know all about farms, what they're like, and uh, I'm sure that you'll be you know, pleased to know that I want to make this place a new South African farm. And you guys have been living here, you know, forever, and so you're in a very good place, uh, position to be able to advise me uh, what, you know, what, what do you think, how, how might we begin um, to, to change the place? I mean, what are the problems? Uh, what, what ideas do you have? And I swear I'm not exaggerating when I tell you this, that the response in each and every case, each one of those alleged one hour meetings, because they, none of them lasted an hour, um, the, 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 the response was silence. Uh, the, the farm workers looked at each other, uh, looked at the floor, you know, uh, 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 looked petrified and dismayed and confused and just wanted to get the hell out of there, you know. And, uh, and I gamely tried, you know, um, to ask direct questions and try to look somebody in the eye and try to engage just one victim, you know, who had to talk to me. And it was, it was like pulling teeth. It was absolutely impossible. And it was excruciating. And, um, you know, so uh, 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 I was really very daunted on even that first attempt. You know, I realized I'm, I'm up against something, even if it's just one farm, I'm up against something that's going to be hell of a difficult to achieve. You know, and I went back to London uh, the next day, and uh, oh, I appointed somebody named Nico Janssen, whose photograph... Um, He's next to me there. The, I'm the handsome one. Or the, uh, the up there. That's him to my left. Um, and I appointed him as manager, I, I promise you, only because he spoke English. You know, it's the, the only person I met on the farm who spoke English and who actually, I knew he spoke English because he actually spoke. You know? So I thought, well, somebody has to you know, be in charge while I'm, before I come back. And, you know, Nico, will you be the manager? And um, so he, I, I phoned him during the next week. Um, just to remind him, I really meant it. He was the manager, and um, asked him how things, you know, were going. And this is what he said, and I remember the words verbatim because they were so stunning uh, to me. He said, "After you left, we—that means the farm people—we said a prayer to thank God for sending us a new owner who we don't have to be scared of." I mean, can you believe it? You know. Sending us a new owner is bad enough. 
And then to say, you know, what's, what's so great about him is that we don't have to be scared of him. You know, not that he's nice, you know. <laughs> so, um, anyway, I must fast forward because I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, I, I am long awesome. So, fast forward. I, I came back with my family, boom, boom, boom. Um, we started uh, renovating the old manor house. At the same time, we started renovating the workers' houses. And I think that that probably was one of the things that gave them, uh, made them realize, actually, this guy probably means it. You know, and they gradually got to realize I actually am different from my predecessors. You know, um, I was obviously spending a lot of money on fixing up their houses at the same time as I was fixing up my house, not only concerned with myself. And, um, you know, we also I changed all sorts of policies. Like, I mean, I didn't even know that there were such policies that if, if it's raining, you don't work and then you don't get paid. You know, it's like, what? <laughs> So, you know, I thought, well, no, ma ma maybe you should be paid, you know, whether it rains or not. No, it's your fault if it's raining. And, uh, you know, and things like that. I mean, uh, unbelievable things. I, I, they, they, I could tell you, uh, well, I will just quickly one or two just to give you the flavor of it. There, there, there was no hot water. You know, farm work, the farm workers didn't have hot water. It's like unbelievable, you know. They're living in the 21st century in, 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 in apartments. By the way, in this building it was, divided into six apartments. This is a wine cellar not made for living in, you know, and it was divided into six apartments, which is a kind of a, 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 a grand word for what they were, um, you know, six partitions, uh, and not even hot water. And um, a, a, one of the farms next door, which we eventually acquired, um, the people were living in the stables. You know, and the then owner of that farm had built beautiful stabling for the horses. You know, and there were people living in the old stables. And uh, in fact, when I, when I um, um, renovated the workers' houses, he came running over to tell me from the goodness of his heart, you know, that no, 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 we don't do it like that. N and explained to me the reason why we don't do it like that, uh, we don't renovate the workers' houses like that, is because when we want to evict them, then we are obliged under the new government uh, uh, a, a protection of, uh, what's it called? It's called the... A security of Tenure Act, yeah. Under the, this act, you're obliged to give them, when you evict them, housing that's of an equivalent standard to what they had on your farm. So you must keep the housing as, you know, crappy as possible. I mean, they're people <laughs> raising families, you know, in these houses. I mean, they're not houses, in these spaces, which are deliberately kept crummy. I mean, kept appalling. So that when you evict them, you know, you only owe them a place like that. Um, what else could I tell you? Well, I suppose that's enough to give you a sense um, of why they thought, well, maybe I am different. So, I'll tell you what happened next. Oh, by the way, this whole story is true. That's the worth of it. Okay, I'm telling you what really happened. Uh, and um, it's, not, um, it's, not, it's not a sanitized story, nor is it a particularly politically correct story. It's just what happened. And I, I, I think that there's some lessons of some value to be learned from what happened. Um, this is what happened next. The farm workers, upon realizing I really meant it, that I really was different from my predecessors, started doing things like pitching up late for work on Mondays, uh, leaving work early on Fridays, in fact, not coming to work on Mondays. A um, uh, few bits and pieces started going missing. Uh, eventually, the pump which is a fairly fundamental thing for a farm, you know, irrigation and all that, the pump was, 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 was stolen. And other things, you know, it was... You can imagine how I started to feel. I felt really pissed off. Um, and, I, I, you know, I thought, I, I, I get it, you know, they, they realize you know, I'm a fool. You know, it's a, if I don't know how it works, you know. <laughs> Don't I realize, you know, I'm in charge? And if I don't realize I'm in charge, that means anything goes. Nobody's in charge, you know. And, um, but also something deeper. And here's perhaps an, an element, uh, a, a deeper element of the psychology of it. Although this I wouldn't say I knew at the time. All I knew at the time was I was pissed off. Um, but on reflection later, oh, it's really echoing. On, on, on reflection later, when, is it, let's just... Ah, oh, thank you. Are you an engineer? Good. So all the disciplines are going to come 
Um, so, um, on reflection later, I, I, I came to the conclusion that the, there was such a deeply entrenched model that somebody's abusing somebody. That's how farms work. That if I'm not the one who's taking advantage of my position, you know, then they must take advantage of me. It was like, it's not possible that you're actually on the same side. You know, that never occurred to anyone. And um, so I was kind of like, you know, being put in my place. That's why when I say all that I knew at the time was that I was pissed off, was that they were sort of saying, well, don't, you know, you're the farmer. You know, you're supposed to be pissed off. You know, you're supposed to be, you know, angry or something. You know, that's how it works. And so, you know, I, was, I found myself being pushed back into this and thinking, yeah, oh, no, I'm, I'm angry. You know, that's all I knew. And, um, you know, and, and, and felt I, I, I also, you know, bloody hell, you know, it's, this is not fair. Um, and then something else happened. Well, I'm just giving you snippets, by the way. I mean, a lot more happened than I'm telling you. I'm giving you snippets. Um, there is down there a beautiful forest. It has established trees. Uh, and among them are camphors from China. Beautiful. And um, I noticed one day on walking through my forest, my forest, uh, <laughs> that one of the camphors had been chopped down. So I you know, took note of that, and then a few days later, another camphor chopped down. So I went to Nico. I said, somebody's chopping down the camphors. He says, oh, you know, I think it's the people across the road. So, at, the, at the farm where they lived in the stables. So I said, um, what, 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 why are they doing that? And he said, you know, they, they, it's firewood. You know, they, want, they want wood. The people, you know, the, those people, they sort of, they, 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 they think, you know, they can take the wood because, you know, they need fire. So I thought, well, it kind of makes sense. You know, it's the, we're, we're, you know, it's the trees and, you know, they're, they're cold and they want wood. And so, you know, that seems fair enough. Won't you please tell them, Nico, that I myself want to remove all the black wattle. This is invasive Australian tree, horrible tree. Um, and so since we're removing the black wattle, uh, let us log it and leave it uh, at the entrance here so that anyone who wants firewood doesn't have to chop down my campus, which seems like an odd thing to chop down anyway for firewood. And uh, you know they can take already logged wood from there. And this was you know, a, a further evidence that I, you know, I really am good um, and nice and different from my predecessors. So uh, the consequence of this, or what happened next, was nobody took any, not one log that I could see was ever taken from that pile. And campus carried on being chopped down. And so now, uh, remember this is psychology. Hey? So now I'm telling about my feelings. So now my feelings were really, you know, this is not nice. And, and there were other feelings too. Uh, <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> I don't get it. Um, the, one of the other feelings, um, which I'm, I'm being very serious now, one of the other feelings was fear. Because I thought, there's something sinister about this. You know, what the hell is this? People going in the dead of night cutting down my camphor trees. I mean, it's an act of aggression. It doesn't make sense. You know, what is this meant to be? Is it saying to me, you know, bugger off. We don't want you here. What is it? What does it mean? So I went back to Nico. Nico says, ask Benny. Now, Benny is, jeez, um, I don't know if I can see exactly. Yeah. So the, fo the fourth column from the end, the chap in the middle with the, with the Mao Tse Tung cap on. Yup, that's him. Middle, middle uh, of, the, of the fourth column from the left. Benny. Daniels. So uh, Nico says, I must ask Benny. I ask Benny. Then he says, yeah, it's those people across the road. So I said, yeah, but why are they doing this? So this is what Benny said to me. Struz God, this is what he said. He said, no, no, prof, it's because they're busmans. So I said, what do you mean? So he said, no, they're busmans. Like, this is the explanation as to why this is happening. So I said, but what do you mean because they're busmans? They're, why are they cutting down my camphor trees? And why are they not taking the... The, the black wattle logs. He said, no, it's because they're Busmans, Prof. They don't think like us. You know? So, this is the sort of thing that happened. Theft, shirking, pushing buttons, chopping down trees, um, and uh, the like, and being told that 
the explanation for this sort of thing is racist. You know? that there's there's, a, there's a, another category of human being, well, not quite human beings. They don't think like us. I don't know what us are. You know, uh, uh, because I don't know if you've taken a close enough look at the photograph of Benny, by the way. He looks rather like a busman to me. <laughs> So, um, you know, I was just thoroughly confused, but, but, uh, but um, I, I need to underscore the seriousness of the feelings at the time. And I really, uh, I was demoralized, I was confused, I was hurtful, I, I, was, I, I, was, I, was, I was scared, uh, I, I was irritated, I thought, you know, what's wrong with these people, you know? I mean, I look at what I'm trying to do for them, and look at how they're reacting to me, and, you know, and then I realized, my God, I have become my own worst nightmare. I now truly and properly was the farmer, you know, and this is exactly how I felt. I felt racist. I thought actually maybe it's true what my neighbor said, you know, because what he said to me is these people, you know, you mustn't give to them like this. They'll take with the left hand and stab you with the right hand. You know, that's what they're like. And, and you know, when you start all these things going on, you start thinking, shit, you know, I, I don't believe that, but, you know, I'm just remembering what he said. <laughs> so um, that's what happened. And... And, you know, I, I, I was just, uh, I mean, I, I'd been here for a good few months by then, and I was just uh, uh, horrified, you know. I mean, I've come back here with this vision of me, the <laughs> white knight who's coming to take over Delta and to change it, and, you know, he's going to make everything different, and, uh, you know, this is new South Africa, and he's going to make his little contribution, and, you know, just you watch me, and, you know, everyone will watch me, and they'll see what I'll do. And it was just all ending in tears. Nothing was changing. Everything was a total mess. I was completely powerless to do anything about it. And I was beginning to think like a white racist farmer. And I was pissed off, which is part of the deal. So that was when uh, I told you that uh, it was lucky that I trained in psychoanalysis. You know, because that was when I, I didn't know what to do. I d I, I'm not a proper farmer. I don't know anything about farming. By the way, that's the end of the part I was going to discuss about agriculture. And <laughs> the, 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 other thing, um, the other thing is that, that um, what I do know about you know, is, uh, is, the, is, 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 is clinical stuff. So uh, when a patient comes into uh, my office at Grotuski, uh, the first thing that I do, I mean, they come in because there's a problem, you know, there's something the matter, and how I address it after asking what is the matter uh, is I take a history. You know, I underline that. I take a history. That's what you do because that's how you understand what you're dealing with. You know, this is the presenting complaint. Okay, when did it start? Uh, what preceded it? You know, what led up to? What was the context within which it started? Uh, how, what was the mode of onset? How did things develop after that? Um, you know, that's how you understand what it is so that you can make a diagnosis. The point of making a diagnosis is because with the diagnosis comes an understanding of what, this, what the mechanism of that is so you know how to intervene to fix it. So truly only as an act of desperation, I, had rec I, I fell back on the only thing I did know something about. And I thought, well, I, I'm, I've got to take a history. That's, that's what I've got to do. And so we stopped farming. And I, oh, when I say, I must emphasize this. When I say uh, I took a, I, I used that model, don't for a moment think that I saw myself as the doctor and the farm workers as the patient. You know, it's not, I'm not saying that the farm workers were the problem and I was now going to take their history. I mean, I was the problem or we were the problem. The thing that was happening between us was the problem. There was a really something sick here, something very pathological going on. And uh, we needed to understand where this came from. And the farmer is slap bang in the middle of that symptom. So we called in other experts to take the history. And those were the UCT departments of archaeology and history. And um, we literally took the history of this place. The, when I say, sorry, I just need to, this is not going to be progressive. I'm just taking off the. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of how things progress in the history. Uh, um, the, what we did was we said, please help us dig this place up and teach us what happened here. 
You know, we, we need to understand the farm workers must be involved in the dig. All of us must be involved in this research. We want to understand what happened on this farm. How did we get to be in the position that we're in? And that was, if I may say so, an inspired thing to do. <laughs> but what at the time wasn't, you know, I didn't know, I, I didn't really have a properly conceptualized idea of why the hell I was doing it. It was, so, you know, it wasn't as inspired as it turns out to look in retrospect. It was, as I've said, an act of desperation. But um, there's another thing, there's a, in psychoanalysis, there's a famous, a famous psychoanalyst, his name was Bruno Bettelheim. And one of his students was telling him what he did with the patient. And uh, Bettelheim said to the student, no, 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 don't just do something, stand there. You know? Which is a very wise thing. You know, some, you know, the, you, uh, in psychoanalysis, you learn how to not have to act. You know, to not have to react, to just say, this is shit, I don't like it, I feel terrible, I'm confused, I don't know what to do. You know, and that's full stop. You know? And then you just, rather than reacting and saying, yeah, you know, these people, or you know, some huffy puffy thing, you, know, uh, uh, it's, it's, you learn how to stick with bad feelings. Uh, and you don't know how to solve them, you don't know what to do, all you do is you try to understand better. You know? So that, that's, that was a, a little piece of psychology I have to bring in here because of my title, Psychological Impediments. <laughs> um, so that, that's what we did. And uh, we dug the place up and we found things. And many of them, you know, you and I uh, uh, probably all know in the abstract what happened here. There's nothing unusual about this farm. It's a typical Cape farm. Therefore, you know, there would have been all the things that, you know, happened in the Cape on these farms, happened here, and that's exactly what we found. But knowing them in the abstract is not the same as researching the history yourself with your farm workers who are living here together and saying what happened here to, to our predecessors here. And uh, it was a hell of a thing. Uh, we found, uh, as you will, on any one of these farms, uh, for example, we found uh, um, uh, uh, the stone tools of the Bushmen who had lived here. And of course they'd lived here. And every single one of these farms you find Bushmen tools all over the place. All over the place. We found uh, about maybe 30, no, yeah, about 30, 40 meters from my front door, uh, we found a Bushman settlement site uh, where there were thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of stone artifacts in one, in one area which just, you know, the, when I say Bushmen had lived here, I mean there they had lived for a bloody long time. You know, that was absolutely the only conclusion you could come to on looking at this density of the deposit of those microlithic tools. And those microlithic tools are exquisite things, beautifully shaped little, um, it's not called flint, but it's like flint. And uh, Benny, who I showed you on the wall over there, was part of the team that discovered that site. And he came, and I'm just choosing, remember, I'm choosing little incidents, you know. Things happened thick and fast. But Benny comes up to me and looks me in the eye and says to me excitedly, you see, Professor, pointing at this blade, this, this little blade that, he, that he'd found as part of that deposit. You see, Professor, my people were here before yours. And it's like, wow, you know. That's that one little moment. It's uh, and uh, again, I'm just giving you a snippet to illustrate the thing that happened in all sorts of ways, you know, a, a, a galore at that during the, those digs. That it changed completely his perception of his relationship to this place. You know, really, it did, and therefore his relationship to me. The power relations between us changed immediately, because you know, implied by that statement is, so how come you own it? You know? Definitely, that's the implication. Certainly, that's my thought was shit, yes. You know? Your people were here before mine. I mean, I didn't say it, but you know, that was the, God, yes, you know, and the excitement of that moment. But also, there were other things embedded in a moment like that, you know, which I'll just mention one of them, which is also kind of obvious. My people. You know, this is the guy who said, they don't think like us. You know, it's like, the, 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 uh, I had never known that, let me tell you, because you probably also don't know it. On these farms, to be a Busman 
is a term of abuse. Yeah? It's, a, it's an insult. Okay, it's a busman. It's like that means you're not a person. You know, you're, a, you're, a, you're, you're less than. Okay, so what not is the other one, just as bad. It's just as bad. So I didn't know that. So the archaeologists come here, they dig this all up, and while they're digging it up, all these things, and the, and the rock art we found in the mount, well, we didn't find it, but we were shown the rock art in the mountains here. And um, you know, the, the feeling of the farm workers who were busmans was, oh, ah, yeah, we're busmans. You know, we painted those things, and you know, my people were here before yours, and you know, these, and they lived here, look, you know, and they made these beautiful tools. And, you know, and the archaeologists were explaining the whole sort of culture and, and incredible you know, way of life and all of that of the Bushmen and the Khoi Khoi. We also found pottery shards of uh, evidence of, of, of Khoi occupation of, of this farm. And um, I have to fast forward, <laughs> shit. And um, so um, the next thing that the archaeologists, of course, tell us is what happened to those Busmans and whatnots. Yeah? You know what happened to them? There was genocide. You know, I mean, first of all, my lot, uh, our lot, the farm-owning types, you know, took these farms. And that was an absolute catastrophe for the economies and culture, uh, cultures of the Khoi and the Bushmen because they were nomadic pastoralists uh, who suddenly came around the valley that year and it was like, you can't come here, it's my land. You know, what do you mean it's your land? You know? I mean, imagine it. They didn't even have an idea that you can own land. How can you own land? You know, it's, like, it's for all of us. It's what we use. You know? it's, it's where we graze our cattle. And, and, no, no, it's mine. You get off. You know, imagine it. And imagine if you're a hunter, hunter-gatherer, you know, bushman. It's like, no, it's my land. I own it now. You know, it was literally catastrophic. It was an absolute implosion of their economies and their way of life. And then you know, just to sort of make matters worse because they were vermin. You know, they hunted your, your, your cattle. And uh, you know, they, they didn't understand that this land was yours. And so you, know, you were allowed to shoot them. You were. You were allowed to. So you know, this is what the... Uh, Benny's saying, you know, my people were here before yours. And then the archaeologists are saying, yeah, and guess what your people did to his people? And it's like, shit. You know, it's like, this is what happened. This is what happened on this farm. You know? And now, when I tell you that Benny is a bushman, and, and, and now proud of it, and Sana, who's over there, I just see her also proud of being a bushman. You know? Really now, proud of it. Why are they here? on this farm, now today in the 21st century. Why are they living on my land? It is a direct consequence of those events then. That's why they're here. You know, those few Bushmen who survived and remained uh, on these farms worked, began to work for us. And they, they had no alternative. There was no other way of, uh, of, of, of managing. And their descendants and descendants and descendants and are still here. And they still work for us, you know. And it was these were the kinds of things that we had to look at um, in this process um, of digging up the history of this place. Um, after the genocide and the annihilation of the way of life um, of the indigenous people of the of the of the Western Cape, um, then we, there were no not enough people left to farm our farms. I mean, to actually do the work, you know? I mean, remember, somebody else has to do the work for you. And so then we got slaves. And everyone that you see on these walls over here, uh, whose face isn't white, uh, and who comes with the farm, uh, if they weren't descended from the Bushmen and the Khoi, they were descended from those slaves who were brought here against their will in droves. Uh, I think by the 1660s already, the slave population outnumbered the settler population. And uh, uh, this farm was built by slaves. This building that you're sitting in now was built by slaves. These walls were literally built by slaves. These beams were put here by slaves. The beautiful gable in the front of my house that I love so much was molded by slaves. And the, you know, I mean, it changes your experience of the beauty of your house. The bedroom that my children sleep in at night, sleep bedrooms, got their own bedroom, you know, uh, those bedrooms were built by slaves. We are living in a house built by slaves. And their descendants are living here still. 
It's no, this is not a, a history lesson. It's just an absolutely simple fact, you know, that there's no getting away from it. That's what's happening. So now this is one, okay, after slavery, as you know, you know, it came a little thing called apartheid. And um, the farm workers remember that only too well. And the history department, the, 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 they took oral histories. It was fabulous, fabulous thing to do. The, to not just escape into remote history, you know, there's remembered history. And as I said, people living on this farm remember what happened then. And they told their stories. Each of us told our stories, you know, of those of us who wanted to. Not, nobody was forced to, of course. And it was the most moving experience of my life to listen one after another to the ordinary stories of just any old farm worker on this farm, the grinding poverty. I've, you have no idea of the daily humiliation of poverty. I had no idea. I mean, you know, I, I feel like a Nazi when I tell you that. I had no idea, you know. Really, it's just absolutely shocking to sit with human beings in your gigantic lounge with a fireplace made by Herbert Baker, you know, listening to these stories about their lives. Uh, one after another told a story about getting their first pair of shoes. This was a recurring theme. I mean, can you imagine it? Remembering when you got your first pair of shoes. They were 12 or 13, you know, it was an event. That's what I mean by poverty. Like Sana told me, she used to put her feet in cow shit to keep them warm. You know, because she didn't have shoes. This is the life of a farm worker. They are dirt poor. And it is horrendous to live like that. And, you know, I said uh, to, uh, to, to, to the people uh, that were there that, that day, I said, as I said to you now, I don't even remember getting my first pair of shoes. So Willie Clarsen, who's there somewhere, says, but you, Prof, you were born with shoes on. <laughs> you know, which of course is true. In, 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 a, in, a, in a very uh, in a deep sense, that's true. And so, and I told my life story, you know, I've never been more ashamed it, uh, ever than telling my life story with my piffling problems. You know, uh, uh, in the context of that, it's, it's, it's something that's worth doing. You know, this Truth and Reconciliation Commission we had, which was a brilliant thing, it was all these big grand events, you know, but we should have some kind of commission voluntary, you know, where people go and tell just those kind of ordinary what it was like um, for, uh, on both sides of, of the uh, divide of apartheid. They're things that we haven't begun to properly take responsibility for, uh, to even properly acknowledge so now these events were happening i have to hurry these events were happening and simultaneously other things were happening and i'll just tell you um well i'll tell you maybe i'll tell you two maybe three and i think i'll keep i'll keep it to two <laughs> this sort of thing happened now remember now what i i was coming back here you know to transform my farm and i was good and, you know, people didn't respond to me exactly as I expected. And I was irritated. Um, you know, this is the context. So now, in this process, I told you how I, re how I, how I renovated the farm workers' uh, apartments. Uh, as the same time as I renovated my house. My kids, you know, they, they, they visited South Africa before. They, they, they went to the beach, you know, Plettenberg Bay, Joburg by the sea. And, uh, you know, they thought, that's South Africa, it's a beach. So, you know, when we came uh, to the farm, the, it was like, where's the beach? You know, and, you know, one thing leads to another, and very soon they were, so, can we have a swimming pool? You know, all the other kids have swimming pools. So I thought, yeah, sure, you know, I'm, I'm their dad, I'm going to give them a swimming pool. And then I thought, what about the farm workers? You know, my, this building is directly in line with my house there. This, they're, they're sort of of a, of a piece. This is called a varf, and they're symmetrical. And, you know, so this house is built, it's 50 meters long, and then there's my house there, it's 50 meters long. And, you know, farm workers were living here, and there in front of my house I was going to build my pool, and I just immediately knew what was going to happen. You know, imagine it. Now, I'm this good guy, remember. So, I had this vision, which I must tell you also came to me as a nightmare, the good guy. It was, they all want to come and swim in my pool. You know, all the farm kids are going to come and swim, but that's not what, I, that's not what my kids are asking for. You know, so then I thought, I'm, how am I going to deal with that? You know, I can imagine all the farm kids hanging on the fence, looking at my two little white kids. You know, 
it's not, it's not running down their nose. They're sort of like, wish, wish we were there. So how are we going to enjoy our pool? So I had this idea. Over here in front of this building, I would build another pool. So I go to Nico, the manager, and I say, Nico, I've got this idea. I'm building a pool for my kids. I think I'll build one here also for your kids. So he looks like very alarmed. And, you know, it kind of like then properly dawned on me, of course, what I'm doing. It's called apartheid. You know? yeah. So, geez, you know, as I told you, I, 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 as the whole process, I just realized I am my own worst nightmare. That's, you know, every, everywhere I look, I see I am the farmer. I'm a white South African. I embody all this stuff. You know, and you can't get it off you because it's in you, because that is what you are. You know? It's actually how you made. So, but Nico wasn't saying that, funnily enough. I said to him, oh, why? What's wrong, Nico? Waiting for him to tell me, you know, haven't you heard of apartheid? And he says, no, but if we have a pool here for our kids, all the other farm's kids are going <laughs> to... <laughs> so uh, I had this next good idea. There was a farm school across the road called Lubeck School. And they've got no facilities. It's a farm school. So we went to the headmaster, Mr. Seister, and uh, said to him, you know, I've got a very good idea. I'm, 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 I would like to donate a pool to your school. Uh, and then, you know, during the day, at school day, the, all the kids at the school will have a pool. And uh, in the afternoon, it can be used by all the community around here. And we'll even throw in, uh, you know, a salary for somebody to make sure nobody drowns. And Mr. Seister looks at me sort of skeptically and says uh, he'll have to consider that and discuss it with his governing body. So again, you know, that feeling, bloody hell, you know, that, 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 that has come up so often. It, it came up then again. So I said, well, you know, okay, let me know. Never let me know. So I phone him back because I want to build my pool for my kids. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, I said to him, uh, you know, remember the thing you were going to talk to? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, we better have a meeting. So I go to the meeting, again, slightly irritated. And uh, this is what Mr. Seister, Lance Seister was his name. This is what he says to me. Professor Solms, you are a good man. And I'm thinking, this is going well. You know? <laughs> so, the, you're not like the other farmers, I think, right on. You know? If they don't care about our people, yeah. And, uh, you know, so it goes on. So thank you. I've spoken to the governing body. We are so grateful. We're so impressed, you know. And the only problem is there's so many things that we need more than a pool. And he gave me a list. And the pool was like number nine or something, you know. First there were classrooms, then there were maths teachers, salaries, and, you know, all sorts of things. And I thought, shit, he's absolutely, I don't know if he did it deliberately, but it, you know, whether he did it deliberately or not doesn't really matter. The fact of the matter is it exposed my motivation. I wasn't wanting to give them something. I was wanting to take something for myself and not feel bad about it. You know, and, it, that, and, and actually I might as well just stop with that. I don't need to give you more examples because that illustrates the whole thing. That was what happened during that process, you know, that I, I realized that it was actually a fantasy of mine, that I could just come here and shed that history. Actually, I could just meet with the people and have one hour meeting with each family and say, how are we going to change it? Great, okay, you know, now it's all gone, and now we're transformed. You know, it's bloody ridiculous. I mean, how stupid can you get? How can you think for a moment, you know, that you can just wipe out that history? It's, as I say, it's inside of me, and it's inside of everyone on this farm, I don't want to speak for the rest of the country. I mean, I'm just talking about this farm, but I doubt that it's that different. You know, and what we have to do, what we had to do was much more difficult. And the bringing, the taking of that history was a terribly important part of it. There were things that I understood. I'll tell you one more anecdote. Nico, Nico comes to me that first April. Uh, uh, no, he didn't come to me. I went to him. I opened the tap. There was no water. The outdoor tap. So, you know, I thought, well, there's something wrong with the municipality's water supplies. You know, go to Nico, he's the manager. And he says, no, no, it's April. I said, what do you mean it's April? He says, no, we don't get water in April. <laughs> so, what are you talking about? You know, so he says, no, Rhodes Fruit Farms or something, you know, they, they, this is when they, they, they pick their, um, whatever they pick, 
and you know, they, they, they use up all the water over there. So, you know, it just trickles through over here, and many hours of the day in, in April we don't get water. And I thought, what kind of mindset is that, you know, that you just sort of wait for May because you know, <laughs> they need the water, you know, and like that kind of, and, and that whole attitude, when you learn about the history of what happened here, and I'm just using one example, you know, think about the history of slavery here. I mean, we had nearly 200 years of slavery here. There were generation upon generation upon generation of people living on this farm who were slaves. So there develops a culture. If you're a slave, you don't think, I'm going to change the world. You know, I'm going to complain about Rhodes Fruit Farms. You just, you know, life happens to you. You suffer it, you know, as best you can. You keep your head down. Uh, you do the minimum, presumably, as well. You don't want to be noticed. I don't know. Whatever you do, you resent, I'm sure, you know. And I thought, you know, just these sorts of things, and as we went through the history of what happened here, there were things I understood about, for example, our relationships as employer-employee on this farm. You know, the attitude to your job. You are not here by choice. You didn't choose to come here. You really didn't. I mean, your ancestors didn't. They're here either because you took their land away, you know, and then said, you're allowed to work for me, or you brought them here from wherever they lived against their will and forced them to work. To work. That's how it happened. I mean, can you believe it? That's what happened. Nothing else. It's not a theory. It's what happened. And then their descendants, 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 descendants come with this farm. Now, today, that's why they're here. And they haven't chosen to sell me their labor. They come with the farm. They're, they're, they're not going to work for the neighbor. The neighbor won't want to take somebody who lives on Solms' farm. Well, why, why is he working for Solms? You know, what's the matter with it? There must be, there must be trouble. You, know, really, you, have, you, know, you, kind of like, you you come with the farm, and you, you, you know, it's, and it's because of that history. I'm, I, I, I'm telling you, I can't think of it any other way. There's no two ways around it. You know, is that the right phrase? There's no other. That, that's just that's just the truth. So that's what you have to face, okay? So when I said, I wanted to just say, look, I'm, I know I look like my predecessors, but I'm not, so it's fixed, and I'll carry on, and I don't have to feel bad. And that's all that I was trying to do. What I really had to do was first of all discover that I'm a racist, you know, and in those nice little ways, I'm a bad racist. <laughs> <laughs> and um, that, and also, you know, that I owe, that, that people like me owe a huge debt. You know, that there is, that, there, that the most appalling things have happened. And it's true they happened, you know, it wasn't me who did it, but I'm living like this and they're living like that because of what happened. And we are directly living the consequences of that now, today, and we've got to face that. You know, and I'll tell you, racism, I realized, this is another piece of psychology, I suddenly understood, racism is a defense. It's, a, it's, a, it's to, to be told, these people are like that, is so much easier. It's such an excuse to, to rather look at why, really, why things are between us as they are. Because the way things are between us, when I spoke about the, the things that went wrong, you know, when I first started here, how, how horrible our relationships were. It's because of that history. Why would anybody be enthusiastic about transforming my farm? You know, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> it's like, I'm all excited. I've come back. I, I've got this farm. Do you want to help me transform it? My farm. You know, the one that was taken from your ancestors and that your ancestors were forced to come and work here. And by the way, you know, that's why you're still there. Ah, but no, so I'll give you a nice roof over your head. You know? The alternative is you have to face that. What really happened, what really went wrong between us, and it's not nice and it's not easy. And remember my title is Psychological Impediments to Land Reform. It's not easy. There's resistance to that. Because let me tell you where this goes. Now, I, I, I presume you know where it goes. You know, once you face the history and you really want to transform this place, you've got to start facing some pretty horrible questions. And the, the biggest question is this. Do I get to keep the farm? That's the question that I had to face. And that's the big question of land reform. So, I thought, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I thought, to be honest. I mean, here I brought my family back here, you know. And, uh, you know, this dream, we're going to go live on the farm in Cape. And, you know, so, 
and, and one thing leads to another, and it's a bloody disaster, and then we try to face the facts and try to fix it and try to understand why that's such a disaster, and the conclusion that you left with is it's not right that I'm in this world. That's what you do. So, I don't want to look, I don't want to see, look, look. don't tell me. Okay? That's what you do. Once you look and you see, guess what happens? You can start to think, you get your mind back. You get your mind back and you can face the facts and say, now what the hell are we going to do about it? Something terrible has happened here and I can't bring myself to give it back. Those are two facts. We've got to have what's called the conflict. You know? and, in, uh, uh, this, and now we've got to work this out. We've got to think this through. So I talked to the farm workers, I talked to Nico, and I told him this. And if he didn't find it difficult to understand, then I couldn't bring myself to get the problem. <laughs> to understand, you know, that's not exactly dealing with the problem to say that. You know? So we came up with a solution, which I'm not going to tell you. And it's a, such an obvious solution. And it's not by any means the solution. It's not the best solution. I'm sure there are a million other solutions. The point is, when you get your mind back, it's not difficult to solve these problems. You know, they're quite simple. If you, if you face them, you know, if you don't face them, of course you can't solve them. You know, but if you actually face them and say, okay, here's the problem, what are we going to do about it? So what we did was, we went to a bank. You know, hello, we went to a bank. And we said, will you please lend the farm workers money so that they can buy the farm next door? And banks don't lend money to farm workers because they haven't got anything. You know, they've got no assets, which is the whole problem that you're trying to solve. So the, the way we dealt with that was we said, we'll put up my farm as collateral. In fact, I, I, an English friend of mine bought the other farm there called Lubbock. And the two of us did it together. We went to the bank and we said we will put up our two farms as security for a loan to the farm workers so that they can buy the farm next door. And the bank said, fine. We lend 50% of the value of agricultural land, 50% plus 50% because the two farms makes 100%. And so they bought a farm. Every bit as big and beautiful and historic and wonderful as this one. And by the way, each of those farms came with people. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, now we have a community of 180 people. And uh, all of them uh, uh, became beneficiaries of this trust that owns that farm. Nobody moved. You know, people still live on all three farms. But one is owned by the farm workers, which means they own one third of the land of this Solms Delta. And they also own one third of the company that farms these farms. And they farm them as a unit. Because as my neighbor, who I keep on reminding you, is actually not a bad guy, Salter Bear, uh, as he came to tell me we don't do it like this, you know, he said, but then I think of your children, you know what risk you're taking on. Yeah, and I thought, my God, you know, as if the risk isn't there, I'm not taking it on, I'm facing it. I'm trying to do something about it. You know? And um, so, because I'm thinking of my children, and so in this very simple way, and also because of that risk, it's in my interest that that farm must succeed. You know? So there you have a realistic basis for skills transfer and mentorship and all of this. You know, I really, I had to make sure that it worked, otherwise I'm going to lose mine. You know? And uh, because we're in it together. You know, really, now we really truly are in this farm we're in it together. You know, if we sink or swim together. And so that's a fabulous basis upon which to establish a proper partnership. You know? And uh, so that's what we did. And um, it's not rocket science. You know? In this way, I get to keep my farm. But I acknowledge that, you know, I mean, self-interest. I want to say this other thing. Self-interest is not a sin. You know, but as long as you remember, it's not you're not the only one. You know, everyone else has got self-interest too. So as long as you, you know, there's the biblical saying, "Love thy neighbor as thyself." I, I properly understood it suddenly. Oh, I get it. You know, that he loves himself as I love myself. You know, he's, he's as important to him as I am to me. You know, if you get that, then it's sort of like, okay, so I want my farm. You know, but I don't want to lose my farm. You know, no matter how I came, to, you know, I came by it, you know, the history and all of that. But you know, he also needs land. Their, their, their land was taken away, you know, and they, they were taken away from their land, and etc. So like, it's not, it's, and, and, you know, it's not, it's not self-sacrifice. I don't believe that you can have a policy. Nobody's going to. There, there was only one Jesus Christ that I know of. You know, we're not going to say, okay, the policy of how we're going to solve the land reform problem is everybody's going to give back their farm. 
you know, I don't think that policy is going to be popular by the, among the landowners. So I don't think they'll go along with it. Um, but saying, you know, that we, there's a terrible history here and we have to face it. Otherwise, look to, look to Zimbabwe about what is going to happen. Somebody's going to take it from you. Of course. Why wouldn't they? And also, why would you, I mean, why would you tolerate if you're the majority of this country, you know, the people who were dispossessed by, by my lot of the land, why would you vote in year after year a government that says it's okay, they can keep it? You know, it's crazy. It's, you, you really, when I say this blinker thing, you know, you've got to be mad not to face the, these things happen. They have consequences. Those consequences are going to occur whether you face them or not. In fact, especially if you don't face them. And the best thing to do is to face them, take a deep breath, it's not easy, and face them. Jesus, there's a lot to face. And the psychological impediments have to be faced. The fear, the guilt, the shame. Then you can say, okay, I've got a lot to answer for you. This is not right. It's not fair. We can't leave it like this. Then you really can start solving the problem. So that's sort of like almost the end of my story. That's what we did, and I want to just quickly tell you what happened as a consequence of that. Well, oh, we made a museum that you visited to tell the story of what happened here. And the people on this farm are very proud of that museum because it tells the true story or it tells their history of what actually happened here, or our history of what actually happened here. Now, guess what? I don't want to criticize anyone. I really don't. I'm not criticizing anyone when I tell you this. I mean, I'm a front shock. Beautiful. Front you know, it used to be called Uli mm -hmm. It was elephant quarter, uh, you know, corner, and then the Huguenots came. And the main sort of thing, appeal of it is that all the farm owners, they got these beautiful manor houses, and they all got French names, all the farms, and you know, even the police station practically has a French name. You know, everything's French, you know. And it's, it's like a little piece of Europe, you know, at the end of Africa. And it's a great tourist destination. And as I said, I'm not criticizing anyone. That's fabulous. But for heaven's sake, you know, why would anybody visit South Africa in order to find Europe then? You know? So guess what happened? We got tons of people coming to visit our museum. We, we get over 30,000 uh, visitors for the last four years. We've never had less than 30,000 visitors in that little tiny museum there. Perhaps. And guess what they do after they visited and looked at that? You know, they buy wine. <laughs> and uh, the, we said, we're doing really well. And then, and then they love us. And then they become customers for life. Because they've come here and they've seen that that's the real South Africa, that they're really tackling the problems. Sports and all that. They're, they're not saints, but they're actually already trying. And you know, and we can see it sort of like, it looks, it looks hopeful. Everyone waves at us and they smile. You know, and, and, they, and they like it. You know, and they, they, they're proud of the place. So imagine the next thing. So what I'm telling you is we, we ended up doing really well, you know, because of this, you know, we don't do it like that, think of the risk. Actually, paradoxically, I think I'm sure we commercially benefited from doing the obvious thing, from doing what's right. I mean, doing a bit of what's right. And, um, the, and then the other thing that we benefited from, we have the most fabulous labor relations in the universe because we're all on the same side. So during the recent strikes and so on, of course the farm workers here didn't strike against themselves, they own the business. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, I mean, and they really do it. That's the other thing that's flowed from this, is that they have undreamt of wealth. And I don't mean that they're rich. I mean, compared to what they they were poor. You know, and now they've got a decent you know, income. It's not only salaries, but also you know, the, 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 uh, the dividends from, from the ownership of the of the bank. Uh, theoretically, they should get a third of the profits. Actually, they get everything. Uh, and it's, not, it's not in the structure of our shareholders' agreement, but the needs, the backlog that we've had to, we've had to build houses, we've had to send kids to proper paying schools in order to, for them to get a proper education. Uh, if you're really going to break that cycle, uh, and all sorts of things we've had to do, but I, I must try and be systematic. So commercially, <laughs> we've actually done well uh, as a result of it. Labor relations or employee or human relations, whatever it's called, gone well, better than ever, unbelievably well. Living here is fabulous. You know, by the way, farmers live on their farms. <laughs> uh, imagine what it's like. It's a paranoid hell. You know, this farm is the, it's like heaven. And the other thing that happened is this cultural um, the rediscovery and reclamation of what it means to be a Usman of a whatnot 
or to be of slave descent, which by the way also I discovered is something to be ashamed of. You know, I mean, can you believe it? The farm workers, when the historian said that, that, that your ancestors, those of you who don't look like Bushmen, you look Indonesian and Malaysian, you know why? Because talk about that. It's like saying, you know, that your, your, your ancestors were pedophiles. You know, it's like something that you never talk about. So the proper understanding of all of that and the airing of it and the facing of what really happened by everybody, most importantly by the owner of the place, recognizing what happened here, but also the people. Looking here, the, suddenly the things that they do, you know, that they thought, it's like, we don't have culture, we just do it like this, you know. All of those things were like, geez, you know, this is the way we do it. And all of this, with all the slave heritage and the cuisine, and the of course, you know, the indigenous elements in the cuisine and so on, all of that, people started to become, I'll tell you one pivotal part about it, and then I'll end. The part of the researching of this museum, uh, where all the bad things that happened here, we didn't only want to research the bad things, we wanted to research things, what happened? It's not only bad, it's a lot that's good. By the way, you know, like the first settler here, Hans Zilbermark, you know, settlers are supposed to be bad. I didn't think he did anything bad. You know, he was a very poor German uh, who wasn't even allowed to own land in Germany. He was a peasant. You didn't work for the Dutch East Indies Company because you wanted to. That was the last, it was the employer of last resort. You know, <laughs> if you had absolutely no hope, you know, then you went to the Dutch East Indies Company. And they gave you a contract, which meant, you know, you were obliged for the next, I don't know how many years, to go and sail on their ships and, you know, you were a sailor or a soldier. And so he was sent here, and uh, then, the, the, because the Koi wouldn't trade with them, they had to make these farms. And uh, so these people like him suddenly became landowners. You know, imagine that. I'm silver buff. You know, he can't even write. You know, now he's told, you know, you're allowed to have 60 Morgan of this land, you know, uh, as long as you sell such and such to the company. I mean, would you then say no? What about the Bushman? You know, of course, it was a catastrophe. It was a catastrophe, but it was the great opportunity for us. And so, you know, the, all the stories are complicated, but I, I must fast forward and I'll tell you. So, um, and I think we need to face that complexity. That's also what I'm saying. Face it honestly. It's, a, it's really the only way that we can deal with it. So, uh, what am I telling you? There was a good stuff also. Part of it was the music. Out of the cultural melting pot of the Cape came this incredible you know, the guma and the astrap and the langarum and the real dancing. The real dancing. I have no idea such a thing exists. I mean, have you heard of real dancing? The main, amazing, amazing thing. And the two arms. You know, all through apartheid, there's real dancing going on. And I swear that comes directly from the Bushmans. You know, you can see there, this one's an ostrich. And the mystic stuff is just like incredible. You know, how did it survive? But it did, and this is what I'm saying. The Langaram parties and so on. The farm workers are like, this is what we do. It's like, no, this is not culture. This is just like what we do. And, you know, it's amazing. It's amazing, amazing stuff. Anyway, so we wanted to record uh, for our archive. Who, is there anyone on the farm who still plays the old keys and sings the old songs and knows them? So we're the musicologists, this is where they come in, you know, they were here to record. Um, uh, Hannes Fluers, burnt out alcoholic, <laughs> says, I did the only kiss. <laughs> but his guitar strings broke in 1970. <laughs> 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 the re the handmade guitar of his, which is under his bed, you know, for decades. And he sits on the stoop and he starts to sing. <laughs> you know, and they're filming it, and the guy filming it is white, and the farm kids come and they say, what the hell is this? <laughs> First of all, Mr. Flores is playing the guitar and singing, and then these white people are filming it. <laughs> <laughs> this is an event. <laughs> so they start to come around, and then Mrs. Flores, Tantana, she comes also like a little... <laughs> Drinker, you know. She comes out, ah, she's dancing. Because <laughs> she has heard her husband you know, playing his guitar since 1970. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, next thing the kids are saying, we didn't know that Mr. First could play guitar. Of course I can. Can Mr. First teach us? Yeah, sure. You know, and then Tom had a band. 
And we had a band with the old codgers and the young ones in the same band. And they called, they called it, God knows where they got the name, the Delta Optal Band. <laughs> and uh, they, they played, you know, we had a few little events on the farm. We had, you know, we had a Christmas party and a New Year's party and so on. And then the local radio station, the community radio station, and Paul heard about them and they interviewed them and they played on the radio. Then they were famous. <laughs> So then, uh, the, the lady, this was Sana, who I keep on mentioning, she said, but we also want to work you know? So the next thing, we have a choir. They call themselves the Sutstemmer. <laughs> and and then, there's, uh, then they wanted to have a marching band, you know, a minstrel band. And so then we ended up with a 60-piece, I think now it's an 80-piece marching band. They, they keep changing their names, so I can't tell you what they're called. I think at the moment they're called the Delta Valley Entertainers or something like that. And um, they also get, all of them get gigs. And then some of the people in the marching band said, they, they want to be said, start a proper stage band, brass band. And they call themselves the Lung Brooker. They're not kids, they're, they're serious. And you know, this place, now we farm music. Yeah. You know? And so when I said about the paranoia and all of that, and imagine what it's like, you know, I drive home and I go, Places like people are it's like to the sounds of music. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, you know, it's, I mean, it's quite heaven. We've got plenty of problems. We've got plenty of problems. But like that whole thing about the music, it was, it was a spontaneous, it was we wanted to record what remained of it. You know, and it just came back to life. Absolutely incredible. And you know, so the cultural life of the swan, the center of it is music, not dwellings. Not sex and drugs. <laughs> it's music. You know, the young kids here, they carry me. We've got three times. We have a voice teacher, a strings teacher, a percussion teacher, a brass teacher, and a songwriting teacher. And they're writing music deeply steeped in their own traditions. You know? And we have a Uspias now. We have a harvest festival <laughs> at the end of March every year to celebrate the harvest and to thank the workers. And they play there. You know, and 7,000 people came last year. It's amazing, an amazing thing. So this is the kind of stuff that happens if you face the psychological <laughs> And I said it's either an alum or at least working at UCT and I contacted you and this happened and thank you so much for everyone who's here today I know the weather wasn't that great but I mean usually we advertise our events a month in advance this one we literally had a week and a couple of days and the tickets were sold out and like I said to you earlier a lot of people have been saying we need to have more of such events and definitely we're going to do the same event again next year I know a couple of people are saying, yes, we'll bring, some more, we'll bring more people next time, and this is an excuse for us to come back. And I think it will be great, and I found out about the wine farm um, last year sometime, and it was an amazing experience, so we'll talk about that another time.
But for now, we're going to take the questions. Uh, if you have any questions, we'll take a couple of questions. And just to note, you said that when the tourists come here, they buy the wine and you know, that's what they do. So I asked and I pleaded with the shop to open until uh, we're done with the talk. So if you want to buy some wine, where we did the museum tour, the shop is open. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> they usually close at five, so we'll take a couple of questions and answers. Thank you. Just to hear the end of the stories about the camp camphor trees, what happened? Okay, so uh, the question was what happened about the, uh, the camphor trees? How did that story end? It just stopped happening. And I still don't know why the hell it was happening. I don't know what it means, but some many things in the, the process you know, that has occurred here over the last... You know, well, it's been several more than 10 years now. Um, you know, many things have happened which I wouldn't be able to explain to you, but I think they're all of a piece. Yes, please. Um, my question is, are you entirely on your own in this kind of thing? Or are there other farms around South Africa where similar uh, initiatives are happening? Okay, uh, thank you. I, I want to say, first of all, I, I want to remind you that my um, intention in coming back here was, was entirely um, citizen-sized, you know. I, I really wasn't trying to create any kind of model for anyone, you know. I was just wanting to fix my own place. Um, but uh, in its success, I have realized, you know, that we have developed a model here. And um, it's... I also want to acknowledge that it's not the only way to do it. I really don't believe it's the only way to do it. In fact, I think all that matters is you have to actually want to do it. I think what's gone wrong with most land reform projects that I've been uh, made aware of is that the, they've, they've been cynical. They've been tricks. They haven't really, there's, they have not really been attempts to actually, and you, and you want to do it when you realize you have to do it. You know? So um, we're not the only ones. Um, we did it this way ourselves. Uh, others have tried other things with varying motives and with varying degrees of success. Um, but I'll tell you this, which is important to me, uh, despite, as I said, what my initial motivation was. Think about the farmer living in fear and guilt and everything that I told you about. And I'm telling you that you know, many people might not even know that they're living in fear, but it's, it's just not like a people ask me. Not me or uh, you know, people are being killed on farms and so on. It's really no joke. And uh, you come and you see what's, what this farm's like. And remember, I still own my piece of land. You know, it's like, and this place, I, I say it again, it's not heaven. It really isn't. And there are all sorts of things we still, we only even realize now as we're doing it, you know, what more needs to be done and what hasn't been resolved. And there's a hell of a lot. But what we've achieved, I think this piece of South Africa has transformed. These 76 hectares. And, um, and, and people who visit here, they can feel it and they can see it, you know, and they like it. So if you're a farmer and you come here and you compare you know, your, with your gun behind your door uh, or like this, where everyone's waving at you and singing, you know, then you think, well, you know, maybe I want to live like that. And remember, as I said to you, when you're a farmer, you live on the farm with the people. You know, it, all through apartheid, it was the only place where actually people lived together. You know, where you have to actually live together. You have to face. It comes at somewhere you know, you know, because you, you have to look at it every day. That there's something really appalling is going on. And, you know, you register it somewhere. So they come here and they see, and they also see ching ching in the wine sales and all of that. And uh, so there has been a lot of interest from other farmers. And genuine interest. I mean, you know that saying, a boor mark a plum. You know, farmers are practical people. It's like, I don't know. Just explain to me again, how does that work? <laughs> you know? And uh, I had a delegation about two, three months ago. I don't, uh, I don't know how long. It was very recently. Of farmers from Dikoa Bockefeld. 70 of them. In this room. They voluntarily, they organized themselves. 70 blooming proper farmers. You know? <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and they said... They said, you know, we, 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 we want to come and talk uh, about what you... We're not saying we believe it, you know, <laughs> but we want to come and talk. And they spent a day here, you know, and I, and, and I, I started my uh, uh, presentation to them by saying, before I start, 
because I know what I have to tell them. I have to tell them the truth. You know, I said, I want to tell you what we did here. Um, before I start, the, I want to tell you what we did here and why. Okay? But before I start, I want to tell you this. I'm not recommending that anyone takes your farm. Okay? So at the end of the story, you get to keep your farm. You know? And then I told them you know, what we did here and why, which involves having to face the facts of what happened here and how come we're living the way we are now, and we have to address it. You know, and they listened really, and they heard it. I'm telling you, really, it was a bloody successful day. Seventy Koa Bockefeld farmers chose to come here for the day to talk about land reform. And uh, I also was invited, invited to talk to the, I don't even know what they're called, CAPSA, Cape Agricultural Employers Association or something. I mean, it's the farmers of the, of the Western Cape. They invited me to come and talk to them. You know, so they, I, 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 don't know, I don't think um, that we have been replicated in droves around here, but there's real genuine interest from real proper farmers. And so I think uh, that there will be one way or another, similar efforts, I hope, in growing numbers, because it works. Um. You know, my experience was, um, first of all, the way my immediate, the question was, what about my immediate neighbors? The first, um, I have to be careful what I say, because I, they're real people, and they live around me. And, and, and is that Richard von Hussling over there? <laughs> so he's a spy on behalf of my neighbors. Um, but... Um, uh, initially, my, my uh, belief is that they thought I was an idiot, you know, and so they didn't take me seriously. They thought, oh, this guy doesn't know what he's doing, you know, so they didn't bother me, and they let me get on with it. Uh, then, when they saw that it worked, the attitude has been, like I told you, a boor marker plum. Also, I was worried when we increased everyone's wages and that sort of thing, you know, you can imagine what it does. Uh, the people on the neighboring farms, it's like, so I earn this and they earn that, you know. And uh, again, I was concerned, but I mean, what's the alternative? You know, you can't, you can't, you've got to pay people a living wage, especially when they're involved in the process of deciding what their wages should be, you know. And um, the, the, um, the consequence has been that the neighboring farms' wages have gone up. You know? There's, I think people, people in this country, a lot of, not everyone, but a lot of people really do want to do the right thing. They want to find a way to fix things. They just don't know how to, you know, and, and uh, if, if, uh, if they see a way that works, you know, they, they take it. So that's been my experience. I must confess, I have had a few horrible experiences, you know. I mean, I've had, a not me, I've, I've, I've had a few, um, like, really horrible threatening letters and things, and, um, but very, very few. Not from my immediate neighbors, from nutters. Um, the only, the only negative thing I've had from my real neighbors is kind of like rivalry, you know? And that's fine. It's like they pissed off that I'm selling more wine than them. <laughs> Can you tell us what the commercial outcome of all of this is? So, um, yeah, well, you all heard that question. I want to tell you that <coughs> starting a new wine enterprise, which we did, although this was a wine farm since uh, the 1600s, uh, after Phylloxera, most, almost all of the vineyards were pulled out. And so when I returned, we returned it back to being a wine farm, which means lots of capital investment. You know, uh, it's, not, it's not just a matter of uh, planting vineyards and maintaining vineyards. You must remember also that vineyards are four or five years before the grapes are usable. It's also a matter of building a cellar. Just the floor of a cellar is a nightmare. You can't believe how expensive it is because it has to carry those gigantic tanks and the acidity of the grapes. And uh, those gigantic tanks cost gigantic piles of money. Um, and you have to you insulate and refrigerate and you know, it's a hell of a thing. And then you have to, you don't just make your wine and stand there and wait for people to come. You know, it's a whole thing of the distribution and the marketing. It's a new label. So it's all we've had. We've invested millions and millions and millions into this. But that's the norm. It's what you have to do in order to start a new wine farm. We have, we have had a, a, a stratospheric sales. We've had not a single year have we had less than 30% increase over the year before. So we're increasing at least 30% per annum in our sales and our production accordingly. Another problem with wine is that when you see, okay, it's going up 30% at least per annum, now I've got a plan. Yeah. You know, I've got a plan for five years from now because as I told you about our wine, it's a slow business. You know, so 
now you, 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 you have to uh, make plans for wine that you're going to sell in five years' time because you don't sell wine the minute that you make the decision. There's the barrels you've got to buy, the maturation process, it takes time, etc. All of that out there. And then when you release the wine, once it's good enough, you know, once it's mature enough, then you start to get the returns. So I'm saying all of that in order to tell you this, that we have only now you know, reached the point where we're properly profitable. So when I said earlier that, um, we, um, that all of our profits go to the farm workers, I have to, I have to, um, I have to qualify it by, step, by saying this. The, the, we, the, we, the return on our investment, you know, uh, if, you, if, you, if you take out our capital outlay, if you look at how is our business doing as a business, we're doing fabulous. But there's an enormous investment uh, that, in, 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 you know, in, in, in some senses, I've deliberately excluded things from the business. You know, like my own house, for example, I could have included it and so on, because it's not only my business, we, we're sharing it with the, with, the, with the workers. So I think that depending on how you do that calculation, in a way, you know, I suppose the bottom line is, in a way, I don't expect some of that investment ever to be uh, to return to me. But uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a sort of, please note I'm not using proper technical terms, because I'm not a businessman, I fear that you are. I, I've never sold anything in my life before I came back here. So uh, the, the bottom line is that the business is making more money than it costs to make it. Uh, and, and out of that is what, how everyone is better. Everyone on this farm's life is completely changed by that. You know, the, the, the kids, as I said, they go to a Model C school. Every kid here. You know, that costs money. And, um, and all of those music things that I told you about, those are all salaries. And we've got social workers. We've got, you know, I don't know how you can have a farm without a full time. We've got two social workers. And uh, so we've also invested in what we make proper houses. You know, everybody's got DSTV. My neighbour again. <laughs> <laughs> the, the people who live on these farms, they live in a little world. You know, they, they don't have there's mountains of the world. You know, to have to have a satellite television, to have those education, to have just just to be able to watch the sport so we can talk about it together. You know, but also the new international news and all of it, it's really been an enormous thing. So all of that we ploughed in, so we're not a proper business. You know. um, but if you cut it down to the actual business, what does it cost? Salaries, you know, etc. Uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, and the actual consumables, the things we've got to buy, and what we're getting back in return, yes, we're making money. Thanks for this extraordinary um, talk. Um, and interested to know, um, as a psychologist, whether there's any um, whether there's any work done um, from a psychological nature in the in the more conventional sense, obviously with alleviation of poverty, with the healing of the use of history and archaeology and music, um, there's a lot of, of healing of pain, of, of emotional pain. But is, and you've got two full-time social workers. But if there is, is psychological work done in um, any focused... Um, you mean on the spot? On the spot, where you okay. need to the way, yeah. Okay. So, uh, uh, sorry, I thought initially you were asking in general. Of course, in general, that sort of thing is research. On this farm, I mean, we have an open-door policy. We've had endless streams of people coming here uh, from all sorts of disciplines to research uh, uh, what, 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 what's happening here from you know, the point of view of the importance of the music project uh, just, just an actual audit, an audit uh, a measuring you know, how people's quality of life, uh, the, the, the actual accommodations, uh, the, the educational provision, etc. Interviewing them about what, how they experienced that, what has it meant to them, etc. All of that sort of thing has happened. We've had business schools from all over also coming to to investigate the business model and you know, see if it's really viable. So there's, we've had a lot of research. Psych I mean, from, I'm the head of the psychology department. I, uh, I don't think anybody from my department at UCT has done that. But I'll tell you what did happen. It was the most amazing experience. I, you know, we were invited to inaugural lectures. <laughs> so one day I get this invitation to an inaugural lecture of a new professor. Her name was Pumla uh, Gavordo Malikazela. And the title of the inaugural lecture is A Psychological Study of Transformation on Song's Delta. <laughs> <laughs> My colleague the doors down the corridor. So uh, that's the, the only thing that's come out of UCT's psychology department. 
And uh, the Stellenbosch psychology department, uh, Professor Malan did a big study. Um, I think he's organizational psychology, industrial psychology. Or something. And um, in fact, I'm working very closely. I was telling you uh, with the University of Stellenbosch. The, the thing that we did on this farm, uh, we, we were approached uh, uh, by some people in Kayamandi outside Stellenbosch. And they said they want to do the same thing in the whole of Kayamandi. They want to dig up Kayamandi and uh, make a museum there that tells the story of what happened in a, in a, in a, in a typical township in, in the Western Cape and so on. And they're partnering with us to do that. But I'm meandering. Yeah. Sorry, that's my answer to your question. Thank you very much, Rob.